Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Ashton. I'm the Director of Communications for the Fish and Wildlife Foundation of Florida. And on behalf of our entire board and staff, I wanna thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day, especially during the holidays, to join us for a conversation about Florida grasshopper sparrows. A couple of quick housekeeping items before we get going. Um, please ensure that you're muted and remain muted throughout the duration of our time together today. The exception to that is during the Q&A portion at the end. During that time, if you wanna ask a question directly to one of our participants, you can use the raise your hand feature. I'll ask you to mute and you can talk directly with them. Or if you prefer, you can drop your question in the chat box um, and I'll ask it for you. That feature is super helpful. If you have a question come up during a presentation, you wanna make sure you don't forget it. For those of you who aren't familiar with the foundation, we are a nonprofit dedicated to conserving wildlife and our outdoor heritage. We were founded in 1994 as a citizen support organization for FWC. And since then, we've been able to raise and donate more than $50 million to conservation work, um, 6 million this year alone to FWC and its partners. Um, one of our main priorities over the last several years has been ensuring that the endangered Florida grasshopper sparrow doesn't go extinct. And we're able to fund this um, breeding and release work a couple different ways. One is through individual donors, several of which I see um, joining us today. Thank you so much, guys. The other is through the sale of our conserved wildlife site, which I just happen to have here. Um, we just recently redesigned it. You're able to buy it on our website. $25 of every plate sale comes to us and we're able to turn around and get that out in grants. Um, so if you're in the market for a new plate, I'd encourage you strongly to consider the conserved wildlife plate. Um, in the last three years alone, thanks to donors and um, conserved wildlife plate purchases, we've been able to give um, over $310,000 to um, Florida grasshopper sparrow work. So to tell us a little bit more about that work. Um, oh, I should say that we're really grateful um, for our partners in that work. Uh, two organizations which are represented here today, FWC and White Oak Conservation, in addition to the US Fish and Wildlife Services, we wouldn't be able to do um, any of this work without our partners. So I'm gonna introduce a few of those partners. We have um, FWC biologist Juan Oteza and Sarah Beesmeyer joining us in addition to White Oak Conservation's Animal Collections Manager, Andrew Schumann. So Juan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hi, Michelle. I'm gonna, I'm setting up here to share my presentation. All right, can you see it? Good. Well, thank you so much um, for the opportunity to share some of the, the work that we have been doing and the results that we had today. Uh, here, um, my name is Juan Oteza, as Michelle mentioned. I'm a research scientist with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, part of FWC. And some of the work that I'm going to be presenting today has been in conjunction with Carl Miller, who's also a researcher with FWC. And then today with us is also Sarah Biesmeyer, who is also part of FWC, and Andrew Schumann, who works for White Oak Conservation. So, um, part of what we want to talk about today is different aspects of the conservation work that we do for Florida grasshopper sparrows with emphasis on the conservation breeding and release program. So this picture that you see here is uh, a, a bird that was raised at White Oak and released into the wild, the, the background picture. And the, the structure on the left side is the aviary where we keep the bird prior to release. And this bird is coming out for the first time into the wild. So um, <clears throat> before I start, I do wanna highlight that this is a largely collaborative effort. We work with Florida uh, state agencies, as well as federal agencies, federal. other organizations that help with conservation breeding, as well as other organizations that help with monitoring birds uh, at different sites. Uh, and of course, a big part of uh, that, big uh, important part of what we're talking about today is uh, the work that we do with conservation uh, breeding and that has been funded by the Fish and Wildlife Foundation of Florida. So this is a, I'll take this opportunity to thank you all for the, your support of the program through the foundation. 
Right, so this is a, a brief outline of, the, of what we're gonna be covering today. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background on grasshopper sparrows, uh, talk about their decline, some of the conservation actions we take, uh, the, then the, the conservation, conservation breeding work, and Andrew's gonna give you, uh, talk about the, the work that they do at White Oak, and then Sarah is gonna cover discussing how we release those birds into the wild and talk about the results that we have so far. So Florida grasshopper sparrows, they're a small songbird. It's a quite a stunning little bird, especially if you look at it up close is they have all these shades of brown and black and this ochreous yellowish color in front of the eye. Uh, they're, they're about 15 grams and uh, they are a non-migratory subspecies of grasshopper sparrow. So they occur only in Florida and they live here year round. Uh, they prefer to live in Florida dry prairie, which is this habitat that you see on the background. And Florida dry prairie is primarily dominated by grasses to, to grassland to prairie. And, but it also has some, some woody vegetation that includes saw palmetto, which is the, the low lying palm that you see in this picture and also runner oak and other plants. Um, they lay, uh, they, they build a small nest that is about the size of a baseball and it's an enclosed nest. So you can see here, that's a picture of a nest with four nestlings and that Sarah took. And then you can see that it has a side entrance and the, it's and a bit of a roof over it. So it's this little ball of grass in a sea of grass and they're quite difficult to find, but uh, Sarah and her crew in the field do a magnificent job at, at finding this nest, which is, as you'll see, an important part of the work that we do. Right, so part of the reason why we're doing the work we're doing is of course, because the birds have been declining for a long time. So this is a figure of the, a, a trend of that decline over time. So what you see here is the number of males that are counted at each of four populations. So each of those lines represents a population that has been monitored for many years. Uh, of course, you can see one of them is, has been monitored from more recently since 2014. <clears throat> and what we have seen across all these populations is that sparrows have been declining. As of uh, 2018, across all four populations, we had counted 48 males. That's an incredibly low number, especially when you take into account that uh, there's generally more females than, than, sorry, more males than females in these populations. So even though there were 48 males, we only detected, we detected fewer than 30 breeding pairs. So pretty dire situation. Uh, and that's part of what has moved us into taking some of the actions that I'm gonna describe. So what, what is the cause of the decline? We know that one of the primary causes is the historic uh, contraction of their habitat. So in this map, you can see that there, this is central Florida and you can see Lake Okeechobee um, on, the, on the kind of on the Southern end there. And the areas shaded in gray represent the original extent of Florida dry prairie, the preferred habitat of the sparrows. And that habitat has contracted by about 80 or 90% over time. And the, the different icons that you see, such as triangles, squares, and star asterisks, are represent historic records of uh, Florida grasshopper sparrows. However, the current extent of the sparrows, it's all within the red box that is shown in the image. So right now, the sparrows are only detected in three counties in Florida. So quite a, a contraction of their his, historic range and we know that has been a big part of their population decline, but there are other factors that we still have to fully understand. So what are some of the conservation, conservation actions that we take? Um, one of them and a, a critical one is habitat management. Uh, we perform research to try to understand other causes of population decline. Uh, we perform monitoring of the population and protect their nests and then conservation breeding and releases. So I will go over each of these briefly um, until we get to conservation breeding and that's where Andrew and Sarah will expand. So the first one is land management. 
an important uh, part of land management is frequent burning of the Florida dry prairie. Florida dry prairie uh, evolved with frequent fires. And similarly, the, the plants that, and, and animals that live within are, are also dependent on, on this fire dynamic. So for example, the, the grasses that occur there depend on frequent fires to stimulate seed production. And that's also important for the animals that eat those seeds, but also in maintaining kind of the, the grass dominated uh, landscape that is necessary for those animals. Um, so we know sparrows like areas that have been burned within the last two years. And uh, in this picture you see on the, on the left side of your screen, an area that was very recently burned, but that bounces back in the rainy season pretty quick within a couple of weeks We've seen sparrows occupy those areas again. There's grasses coming out and they'll even nest there uh, within just a few weeks after burn. Um, but, and not only that, within a year, that those areas will, will look just as most of the other, uh, as parts of the prairie. So it's a quick uh, return to those conditions. Uh, when certain areas are not burned frequently, or if there's changes in hydrology, for example, you will see that uh, woody vegetation can start encroaching and taking over. So we see those, for example, those palmettos that I showed you earlier, uh, they will start growing vertically a little more, or some other plants will start to, to take over. And at that point, fire alone can't revert the prairie back to its original condition. So we sometimes go in and, and perform mechanical removal of those woody vegetations. And um, we are performing some research currently on, on the effects of this mechanical removal of woody vegetation. And we have seen a, a very positive impact in, in terms of how sparrows are utilizing those areas. Uh, in terms of population monitoring, a, a key part of what we do is we put a, color, a unique combination of color bands on the birds to be able to identify them. So you can see a, a bird here that has four color, uh, four bands, three that are plastic color bands and an aluminum federal band. And this allows us to identify a bird from a distance. And we usually put these bands on the birds before they leave the nest when they're nestlings. So we minimize the, the need for catching them to, to, to see who is who in the population, but it also allows us to understand their demography better. So once the birds are banded, we perform behavioral observations <clears throat> excuse me, uh, using binoculars and spotting scopes to see the birds, follow them. Uh, we, this allows us to, allow us to estimate their survival rates uh, when the birds are breeding, and importantly, then try to go in and, and find their nests. Once we find their nests, uh, an important action that we take is nest protection. And we do this in, in many different ways. What you're seeing here is an image of a, of a grasshopper sparrow standing on top of a, a, a predator deflection fence. So this is a fence that we set around the nest. Once we find the nest, we put this fence around it to prevent mammals and other predators from getting to the nest, but it allows the bird to fly over it and, and access the nest. So you can see there's a bird for scale uh, on top of the fence. These are about uh, two feet tall fences uh, of hardware cloth. And then uh, they're about 15 feet in, in diameter. Another action that we take is nest lifting to prevent them from getting flooded. So even though this is the Florida dry prairie, this habitat gets flooded every year during the summer. And the main, uh, one of the main actions that we do is lift the nest about an inch off the ground to prevent the nest contents from getting uh, wet. And because otherwise the, the eggs or nestlings may perish if they get submerged. So uh, that has been very effective. And then lastly, for in areas where there are fire ants present, if we find fire ant mounds uh, within 20 meters or so or more of the nest, we will boil, use boiling water uh, over the mountain to try to eliminate them and because they can also predate uh, Florida grasshopper sparrow young. So as you can see, we, we take a multi-pronged approach to help sparrows. We take all of these actions, but uh, the most recent one, one that has proven very effective too, is the conservation breeding and, and release program. This has, uh, has, has had 
positive results in augmenting the wild population. So to talk about the conservation breeding, I'm gonna hand it over to Andrew Schumann. And I'll stop sharing. All right. Thank you, Juan, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Andrew Schumann. Uh, I'm an animal collections manager at White Oak Conservation. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our role in conserving the Florida grasshopper sparrow. So White Oak is located in Northeast Florida. We have about 17,000 acres on the St. Mary's River. And that is the river that separates Florida from Georgia. It's a very large secluded property uh, and we're fortunate to have it. Um, we have three main pillars to our mission. That's conservation breeding, conservation education and land stewardship. And all of this allows us to do our conservation work uh, here and abroad. Probably what we're most known for though is our conservation breeding programs. Uh, we have the most threatened and endangered species from around the world. Uh, and we are fortunate to have the space we have and that allows us to keep some of these larger animals that need lots of space uh, and breed them successfully and do conservation work with them. Um, and so our general philosophy is, you know, big spaces, natural social organization, hands-off management, uh, kind of, you know, leave the animals alone, let them be who they are and do what they do, and, and they'll do the breeding and, and be very happy and healthy, of course. So our, our, probably the most the species we're most known for are probably the three up right now, the, the cheetah, the okapi, and the white rhino. So there's only a handful of cheetah breeding facilities in the U.S. and in the world, uh, and white oak is one of those. Um, okapi are a very secretive forest draft. Uh, white oak's done a, a large amount of, of conservation work in Central Africa, where they're from, and uh, we also have very wooded uh, areas that they love to inhabit. Uh, and then rhinos, obviously, they, we were able to have large groups of rhinos, which helps with their breeding success. Uh, and so these programs are probably what we're most known for, but uh, recovery work is another aspect of what we do. And so uh, we breed uh, animals for release uh, into the wild. Uh, we've been working with cranes, Mississippi Sano cranes since the early 90s, uh, whooping cranes as well. And we release those every year. Uh, and Florida Panther, uh, we have a rehabilitation program with the Florida Panther. So if one were to be injured in South Florida, they're medically treated and they're brought to White Oak into a large 12 acre habitat where they're rehabilitated and then re-released. Uh, and we've also done work internationally, of course, with recovery and that includes releasing Indian condors. Uh, and we've also done some work with uh, Curacao as well down there. Um, so that brings us to grasshopper sparrows. So uh, White Oak became involved in 2015 um, we partnered with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, FWC, and Tall Timbers Research Station, and a few other partners uh, to try to figure out, okay, Florida grasshopper sparrow is going extinct. Uh, how do we bring them into our care? Uh, how do we care for them? And then how do we breed and release them? So we didn't know the answers to any of these questions, and there were so few Florida grasshopper sparrows left that uh, we implemented a, a program with a model species, the eastern grasshopper sparrow. And so uh, we brought in Eastern grasshopper sparrows in 2015, uh, started caring for them. They did great. Uh, in 2016, they started breeding prolifically and we started releasing those uh, birds uh, to test and refine those, those protocols. And so because it was so successful in 2016, we started uh, our Florida grasshopper sparrow flock here at White Oak. Uh, the next few years, we built that flock until releases began in 2019. Um, and they've occurred annually since then. And White Oaks uh, produce large numbers of chicks annually, a uh, higher number every year. We try to at least, uh, again, because we're, we're getting better at this and we're coming up with solutions on how to produce more and more. Um, and so this year we released uh, 231 sparrows from White Oak. Um, and the photo in the background is from Joel Sartori. Uh, and that was actually taken at White Oak. Uh, he's a big supporter of the Florida Grasshopper Sparrow Program. And uh, his project, the Photo Arc, uh, works on capturing some of these uh, photos of these species before they go extinct to try to garner support. So uh, really great work. So how did we do this at White Oak? Well, uh, I'm a huge bird watcher. So I found a spot at White Oak that we had Eastern grasshopper sparrows that wintered. And uh, so obviously that's good habitat for grasshopper sparrows. So uh, we placed facilities right on top 
of that habitat and huge, huge facilities for such a small bird. Uh, and uh, of course, that's all so they could do what they're supposed to do. And we implemented prescribed burning uh, annually outside the enclosures, but also within. And that serves uh, a role to reduce the density of vegetation so the birds can move through the, the habitats better, uh, but also increases seed abundance and insect abundance, which of course uh, supplements the, the captive diets we, pro we provide. Um, and so fire depend species and they, they use us. So they, you know, the grasses produce seeds and the birds eat them. Um, the, there's lots of grasshoppers and all kinds of insects. Uh, that the birds love to forage on. And of course that leads to breeding success. So I thought I'd walk you through what it's like to grow an endangered sparrow. <laughs> so uh, it's very difficult. Uh, this is what we see uh, in the breeding season uh, of a nest. And if you see nothing, that's because it's really difficult to see grasshopper sparrows uh, and their nests. So, um, you know, in February we keep pairs of grasshopper sparrows and in February they start to sing, the males will sing. Um, and then usually around March, one of your birds will go missing. And it's not because it escaped, it's because uh, it's incubating. And, and uh, you know, basically this happens uh, in March and it's difficult to catch, but sometimes we get lucky and we do catch the birds nest building. And so that makes finding the nest a lot easier. Uh, this female, if you look at her rear, it's kind of swollen. Um, that's because she actually has an egg in her tract, which is why she's walking so gingerly. Um, and there she is building her nest. So obviously she's doing her final touches and she'll probably lay an egg this evening. Um, and, uh, and she disappears. And that's because that's what grasshopper sparrows are good at. Um, and then after 12 days of incubation, um, you'll start to see this, um, which is the birds going to the nest uh, it's very difficult to see where they're going. Um, a lot of times they won't fly and land directly at the nest openings, right? So they'll fly to the side and, and run to the nest. Um, but both parents care for the young very diligently. Um, the males in particular um, do a great job. And even when the females are incubating, the males will oftentimes bring food to them uh, at the nest. And when they're young, they get more grubby, uh, soft, small insects. Uh, and as they get older, they get kind of bigger, more chitinous insects. And I don't use the word cute often, but the chicks are extremely cute. Um, and these, this is a nest of four. Um, and then after nine days in the nest, they fledge. Uh, immediately after they fledge, the adults will recycle. And so they go right to copulating and nest building uh, and building a new nest. And, uh, and then eggs happen. So this, this is a, uh, an adult male feeding five nearly independent chicks. Uh, and so you're wondering where the female is. Well, she's incubating. <laughs> she's incubating a whole other nest. So every 25 days, uh, a pair will have a clutch of chicks hatch. And so if you have 13 pairs of birds uh, hatching <laughs> birds every, every 25 days, that's a lot of birds to keep track of. But you can see the males are, are really important in, in rearing chicks. And so once the chicks are weaned at about 21 days, we'll remove them from their parents and they get put into these very large groups. Uh, and this we, we manage a little differently. We keep them in large, in large habitats that uh, have lots of uh, grasses and natural forage. We provide them with native seed and native insects. Uh, and again, we only monitor them via camera traps. So very hands off. This program's been neat in that, you know, it's such a secretive, small camouflage bird. Uh, when, we, when we bring them into our care, we're able to learn a whole lot about them. One such example would be uh, nest building. Uh, I remember in the early years telling the wild biologists that the males were nest building and they were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so uh, we learned pretty quickly that males do nest build. It was thought that only females did. Uh, although females almost always finish the, the nest. So the males are not very good at it females would do the finishing touches. Another thing was the female call, the trill call. And it was thought that it was only females, but we quickly learned that males do it as well. And that's the trill call. And the males will do it while they're sitting in nests and just as communication with, between them and the, and the females. 
So just like it takes a village to raise a, a child, it takes a village to raise a sparrow as well. So from our interns um, to our maintenance and carpentry teams to our veterinary teams and, and even our education teams, uh, everyone's contributing to conserving the, the sparrow here at Whiting. Uh, one of the things that always strikes us with this program is the, the teamwork and collaboration. Um, it's been such a rewarding experience uh, just to share ideas and knowledge between us breeding facilities and the wildlife biologists. And I think as a result, we're, we're able to find success uh, more quickly. And uh, we also get to have fun while we do it. And that's been one of the most rewarding things to this program for me. And of course, we couldn't do it without all you guys out there and Fish and Wildlife Foundation of Florida for supporting our work. So thank you. And you can also visit White Oak, uh, this is our website and uh, all of the social media platforms. And uh, I'll lead it off to Sarah. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. All right. Hello, my name is Sarah Biesmeyer. Um, let's see, hold on a second. Okay. Hi, my name is Sarah Biesmeyer. I am the Florida Grasshopper Sparrow Site Supervisor for FWC. And my job is to oversee and work as part of the field crew monitoring the sparrows in the wild. So after White Oak's fantastic work growing the endangered sparrows and caring for them at their facility, um, it eventually becomes time to release these birds into the wild. So on the day birds are going to be transported to the release site, um, White Oak staff will carefully go into the enclosures, they'll round them up, um, we will reevaluate their condition. Um, they've gone through a broad health screening process already, but we just want to make sure that they're still looking good, they're still in healthy condition, and they are ready to live their lives as wild birds. Uh, we will give each individual a unique set of color bands. That's how we will be able to identify them in the wild and how most of our monitoring occurs. Um, and in the early days of the project, we also were affixing a radio transmitter on some of the birds to monitor how they did in the first few days after release. So you can see here this little um, harness backpack on this bird. Um, that was a radio telemetry device that we were using to monitor their short-term survival. Um, birds are then transported to the release site. They are taken in these very nice sturdy crates that White Oak made. Um, each compartment holds a bird and we bring them to our aviary at the release site and let them, let them go just by sliding the door open. You can see them flying out here. Uh, and these, the aviary at the release site is built um, exactly like the ones that White Oak has. So they're very nice, it's a very nice structure. Um, and we have a bunch of nice dry prairie vegetation on the inside. It mimics the natural conditions that the birds will find on the outside. Um, so we will bring them to the aviary for, for an acclimation period. We'll monitor their behavior during that time, make sure that all the birds are still acting normal and healthy and are ready for release. So we'll put some trail cameras on their food stations um, and just do some monitoring. The birds will spend about two to five days in the aviary um, acclimating. So this acclimation period is a time for the birds to rest and recuperate from travel, eat some food, um, get adjusted to their surroundings before it's time to become wild birds. Uh, so after the acclimation period on release day, we open up the aviary by taking a whole side of it off. Um, <laughs> and the birds are allowed to fly free. So it's nice, they've got this large space um, to just kind of enter, enter the wild. And there's one you can see flying out right there. Um, more often though, these birds do like to scurry or walk out of the aviary. They are very much ground dwelling birds. So often they will walk rather than fly. Um, and we give them 30 to 45, 30 to minutes to an hour to leave the aviary on their own. Um, however, some of them don't leave in that time. So we will just go in there. I am just gently encouraging the birds to leave. I'll do a couple sweeps through, make sure that all the birds have left and are out before we will close the aviary back up. So that, all right. Um, so how many birds have we released so far? 
Well, so far, thanks to the wonderful collaborative efforts, we have released almost 400 birds at our first release site over the past three years. Uh, and this has been great to get that many birds out on the prairie with hopes that some of these birds will survive and breed and contribute to the population. Uh, one of our main research questions for the release project has been, what is the release age that maximizes settlement and recruitment rates? So we've been releasing birds in two different age classes. We've been releasing them as adults, and we've also been releasing them as juveniles. Um, and we, want to, we wanted to see which of these release groups would survive best, would settle best, would breed, would do, which of these two age classes would do, um, would show the best results. Um, and so this is a male here who was released in 2019 as an adult and over on the right of the screen, we have a female who was released as a juvenile in 2019. And both of them have successfully um, survived and bred and were in our population in 2021. Um, so we have had fuller grasshopper sparrows released as both adults and juveniles settle and successfully breed at the release site. However, we have been seeing better results with birds released as juveniles. And we do think that this is um, the strategy or method that we'll most likely be using for future releases. So 2019 was the first year that birds, the floor grasshopper sparrows were released into the wild. Um, so very, very historic, important time in the floor grasshopper sparrow world. Um, and what we saw from these first releases was their short-term survival. We were seeing that um, release birds were behaving just like wild sparrows. Um, so we were tracking them with, the, with telemetry and we were also opportunistically reciting these birds from, um, with their color band combinations. And what we were seeing through these observations were that they were um, foraging on their own. You know, they weren't reliant on having a food bowl. Um, they were able to survive and forage and eat um, just like the wild birds. They were flying around the study site and exploring. And we even saw them interacting with other floater grasshopper sparrows, both other release sparrows and wild sparrows. So it was very promising um, short-term results, but a big question remained for the, the next year, would these birds survive long-term and would they stay and breed um, at the study site, which um, it, we we're really hoping to detect signs of breeding because this would be critical to the success of the program. So in the early spring of 2020, we got our answer and it was happily, uh, yes, these birds were doing well. Um, we began to see released males perching up, defending territories and singing, acting just like the wild birds. And they also found mates and bred. The release birds paired up with other release birds, but they also paired up with wild birds as well. So they were becoming very incorporated into our population. Um, and they also successfully fledged young. So they were tending to and caring for their chicks and managed to successfully fledge young. Um, so they were doing fantastic. It was really great to see that um, these birds could survive in the wild and that they could produce young. And uh, now I'm gonna show you, this is from one of our nest monitoring cameras. Um, this is the adult, the female of this nest walking by. She is a released female and she is followed closely by her fledgling. There he is. So this nest, the nest was kind of back in um, behind this palmetto. Um, both parents of this nest were released birds. And so very exciting to see that they can produce young on their, on their own or doing a great job. So in 2021, we continue to see success with release birds, which is great. We had very similar results to um, what we found in 2020. Um, birds were continuing to survive and breed um, and incorporate in, in the population. Um, we gained a second year of data, which was very important for our study. Um, the combined 2020 and 21 data um, showed that we had overall better, better settlement and recruitment rates with the juvenile, with the release birds who were released as juveniles. So these three beautiful, handsome males here on screen, um, they were all released in 2020 as juveniles, and they survived and were part of our breeding population in 2021. Um, so we are seeing more birds who are released as juveniles survive and breed. However, we do still have some success with 
birds who are released as adults. And here's one of them now. Um, so this is another nest video. Um, that was the adult taking food to its, um, to its nestling. Um, and this bird was released um, just a few months before this nest video was taken. He was released as an adult this year. Um, and he paired up with a, another release bird and bred and they had this successful nest. So um, you can tell who it is based on, you can see those color bands kind of on his legs. That's how we will mainly identify them in the wild. So I know that this is the male and you can see his chick there is about to take his first steps out of the nest. There he goes. <laughs> Dad's doing a very good job being, being vigilant. Um, and he, the, the female of this nest, as I mentioned, is also a release bird, and she was released as a juvenile in 2020. So there, there's that cute bird. <laughs> um, and you can see on this fledgling that he also has color bands, so we'll band them as nestlings um, so that we can identify them in our future populations as well. So just an example that even though we are, um, seeing better success with birds released as juveniles, we are seeing birds that are released as adults do well as, uh, as well. So like this bird here was kept at White Oak for an entire year. Um, and when he was released, he's still you know acting like a wild bird and able to care for and raise young of his own. Uh, another exciting occurrence in 2021 was the wild produced offspring of released birds in 2020 were now adults in breeding. So to explain this a little better, um, so we had we released birds in 2019, and then in 2020, those birds survived and they, they bred in 2020, uh, produced offspring, and their offspring that they produced in 2020 um, survived and were adults in the 2021 population, now producing their own offspring. So it's nice to see this generational impact that the release birds are having on our population. And just a few slides ago, I showed the, that in 2020, um, the release birds produced this fledgling, and he, um, so he was produced in 2020, and then this year in 2021 was one of our release birds, sorry, one of our breeding adults who produced from a wild nest by release birds. Um, I'm going to show another nest video because I can't help myself. <laughs> They're so cute. So there is um, the female of the nest. She's bringing food to her begging chicks, uh, and she is also an offspring of release birds. So she was produced in 2020. She's now an adult. This is her first year breeding and caring for her chicks. So this is from one of our 2021 nest videos. And she is taking the fecal sack away. So she's been a really good mom, keeping the nest nice and clean. Um, <laughs> even though he just pooped again. And there he goes running off. So another cute fledge video um, and exciting to see the um, offspring of release birds now. Um, having offspring of their own. So her dad was a wild bird and her mom was a release bird who was released as a juvenile in 2019. And also there she goes taking another um, fecal sack away. And um, the parents are very good at removing the fledglings, I'm oh, sorry, the nestlings like poop from the nest because you know, cuts back on, keeps the nest nice and clean, cuts back on the bacteria buildup, but also scent buildup, um, keeping it nice and not stinky and attracting predators, so. Very cute to see that. So um, and he's about to pop out here as well. Um, but yeah, so the male of this nest is also a release bird. So they are a huge part of our of our population. So there's this guy's fledged now too. And then there's that other <laughs> fledgling. So mom's definitely got her wings full, if you will. Um, she's, you know, just kind of trying to adjust to the fact that her babies are now mobile and she will uh, care for them for the next um, two to three weeks um, before they become independent. All right, so besides behaving like wild birds and successfully caring for their cute chicks, um, the release birds are significantly helping to boost the population at the release site. Uh, we project that the population at the release site would have declined if it had not been for the releases. For both 2020 and 2021, um, almost half of uh, the Florida gossiper sparrows detected in our population were released birds. Also, over half of the fledglings produced in the wild came from nests with at least one released parent. So they are having a significant impact. Um, here's a graph to further illustrate how the population decline was offset by the released birds. So this is a graph showing the number of Florida grasshopper sparrows detected at our release site 
over the past few years. Um, and you can see here, um, 2019 is when releases began. Uh, and we only detected about 37 wild birds in 2020. So we, we estimate that the population would have declined if it was not for the release birds. So this is just what the population we think would have looked like um, without the release birds. But fortunately, releases began in 2019 and did offset that trajectory. So we've got, we, we saw an increase in the population in 2020, thanks to the release birds. And then um, also in 2021, we were up to over 90 birds in our, at our release site, which made for a very busy season. It was very exciting. Um, of course, other factors are also accounting for the slight increase in population trends that we're seeing. Um, we are continuing to um, implement the nest protection efforts that Juan talked about, um, as well as habitat management uh, protocols. So we are continuing to put up these, these predator deflection fences around every nest that we find, not just for wild birds, but also for the release birds. Um, this is a release bird here too. She has food in her mouth and is about to go down inside to where the nest is to feed her nestlings. Um, and these fences have uh, been a big success for us. They've been very helpful at helping the productivity and helping get more nests to fledge. So definitely an important conservation um, effort that we've implemented on our release site. Um, but habitat management is crucial as, as well to, um, to conserving this species. So we're still continuing other actions. Um, so there's a graph uh, showing the sparrow population trend of the four sites that are currently being monitored. And this is representing the number of males. Uh, and so the release birds and all these conservation efforts are definitely helping to boost the population. This is the part of the graph that I showed a few slides ago. Um, however, the overall population still remains low, as you can see. Um, we, we still have quite a ways to go to even get back to numbers that we were at 15 or 20 years ago. So we're still a critically endangered species. Um, there's still a lot of work ahead of us to try and uh, recover this, this population, uh, this species. Moving forward, um, so in 2021, we did begin releasing Florida grasshopper sparrows at a second site. Um, and we are highly anticipating results of that um, in 2022. And we plan to continue releasing Florida grasshopper sparrows at both sites in 2022. That's our current plan. And of course, um, we also plan to continue habitat management, population monitoring, protection, and research. So in summary, um, the first two years of results are very encouraging. Uh, we saw good settlement and recruitment. And to reiterate, we have observed an 84% increase in the population at the release site since releases started in 2019. Um, overall, though, the Florasifer sparrow population still remains low. Um, they are not out of the woods yet. We still have a lot of hard work and um, conservation efforts ahead of us. Um, the releases are part of a multi-pronged approach to help the sparrows, so we can do some ongoing research to identify management solutions and other uh, factors that may be limiting the sparrow population. Um, but, but overall, the, the releases are doing what we set out to have them do which was to stabilize and boost the population while we can you know, work on and develop and improve some of our other conservation efforts. So things um, have been fairly positive for these first two years of results and we are excited at what we're seeing, um, but we all know it's still a, a long road ahead and still a lot, of, a lot of work, but thank you so much to everyone Who's here today. Thank you for all of your support. Thank you to um, Juan and Andrew for your presentations as well. And um, that is all I have today. And I believe it's time for some questions. Thanks, Sarah. You're right. And um, just wanted to reiterate um, thanking Juan and Andrew, in addition to Sarah, for their excellent presentations. Really always love seeing the videos. Um, those birds are so stinking cute. So, um, Julie and Tony have asked the same excellent question that we're going to get us going with about what are the sparrows natural predators and how significant is their impact on the sparrows population. I know um, both Sarah, you and Juan showed um, graphs of the sparrows population decline. So I think that was um, related to at, the question is if um, predators may be contributed to that as well. 
Yeah, the we know for for songbirds in general, nest predation is an important uh, is the most important uh, cause of nest nest failure. So it it's it's common and natural, uh, but we detected early on that it's particularly high for Florida grasshopper sparrows. So it's a bit concerning. That's what led us to decide to find nest protection measures. Uh, in terms of the nest predators, we I would say small mammals or, or meso mammals uh, are the primary predator, predators, primarily um, skunks, opossums would be some of the main ones, and then every now and then raccoons and other animals. Um, there's also occasional predations from avian predators, but those are not common. And uh, there's also snakes. So we know the, the predator deflection fences are incredibly effective against mammals. We don't have uh, virtually any mammal predations when we set up those fences. The snakes are a little trickier because some species in particular are capable of climbing and especially when they're large enough, they can access the nest. So um, we're looking for ways of improving them, but uh, they have improved dramatically the productivity of, of these uh, birds. And I know Juan, you mentioned um, fire ants as well during your presentation. Are they, are they killing the eggs or what is their impact on grasshopper sparrows? Yeah, thank you for mentioning that because I, I sometimes forget because I'm thinking more of a more natural predators, not that fire ants are natural, but they're introduced and they are a big problem and they're a bigger problem in so, at some sites than other. Uh, fortunately, at the release site where this population that we've been talking about, uh, we don't have as big of a problem with fire ants, but they can be pretty problematic in other places. And they usually don't really attack the, the adult or the eggs, but once the nestlings, uh, the eggs hatch and, and there are nestlings, they can attack the nestlings and they can do this at pretty much at any stage of the nestling uh, period. So this is a, a big problem and that's why we look for fire ants around. Once we find the nest, we look around the perimeter just to see if there's any fire ant mounds that we need to take care of. I don't know if Andrew or Sarah want to add anything to any of that. <laughs> um, we had another uh, question. Um, Julie's wondering about um, if pollution contributes to um, to sparrow uh, work with grasshopper sparrows. I know um, that's obviously been in the news a lot with Indian River Lagoon and um, the impact of um, nutrient pollution on algae bloom. So maybe that's what's inspiring Julie's question. I, we don't really have any um, evidence that pollution is directly causing any, uh, having any negative impacts on the populations. Uh, that's not to say that there may not be, but because these birds require somewhat undisturbed areas, they tend to be away from major sources of pollution. Um, but yeah, I don't know if Andrew or Sarah, you guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah. <laughs> um, Juan, while we, uh, while we wait for some other questions to come in, I know the work that y'all are doing is on, um, is on public land, but um, do you wanna talk a little bit about grasshopper sparrow populations on private land. Um, the foundation about this time last year was part of the group with DU and um, UF that helped conserve um, 27,000 acres in Central Florida near Yeehaw Junction, the DeLuca Preserve. Um, that uh, was part of an excellent five-part series in the Orlando Sentinel by Kevin Spears and one whole um, one installment of his series was dedicated to Florida grasshopper sparrows in case people haven't gotten a chance to read it. I highly encourage it. So I don't know if you or Andrew or Sarah want to say anything about um, grasshopper sparrow populations potentially on some of these other nearby private lands. I don't want to monopolize the conversation, so <laughs> let Andrew or, or Sarah take over. Oh, Sarah, I think you might still be muted. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. So it was very exciting to um, that the, the land was able to be protected and, and acquired. Um, and it's huge, not only just for the um, 
sparrows, but also for several other wildlife that use the land. Um, but um, but it's been it's been very encouraging, and it's also going to be helpful if we need if we decide to go um, look at other sites for for releasing birds. Um, but it definitely allows for more conservation for the sparrows as we've got more um, funding and, and availability to monitor and, and protect that population. Thanks, Sarah. Well said. Um, we have a, a question from Dan, and I'm going to, um, Andrew, I'm going to send this one to you, and I'm going to hope that you know this technical language better than I do. So I'm just going to read it exactly how Dan wrote it. Is there a risk of genetic dilution with the Eastern grasshopper sparrow? Uh, I don't know uh, from a from a from the conservation breeding standpoint. Uh, you know, we obviously keep them separate. The Florida grasshopper sparrow is a year-round resident in uh, in Florida. The Eastern grasshopper sparrow uh, is not. Uh, they migrate away from Florida. There's a couple of non-migratory populations. That we don't really have a good understanding of in places like Georgia, uh, but uh, so that that really limits the ability for hybridization to occur. Uh, I know uh, in, at White Oak, it's pretty obvious to us the difference between the subspecies. Uh, the eastern grasshopper sparrow uh, was always lighter in color; their song is different, um, and for us, it was it was pretty obvious. We had we had one intern in particular that said she could very clearly distinguish the the songs. Uh, I had more trouble doing that, <laughs> but uh, they do, they are proven to be distinct. Um, so uh, that's probably all I can say from my perspective. Juan, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, in the wild, uh, we don't have any evidence of Eastern grasshopper sparrows breeding with Florida grasshopper sparrows, but there was some recent genetic work that indicates that there may be very little of that happening, like one one individual eastern grasshopper sparrow breeding every several generations. But uh, that there's still more work that needs to be done there. But it doesn't seem to be a problem in terms of diluting the the genetics of the Florida grasshopper sparrow that could have an impact, uh, a negative impact on on their kind of their uniqueness <laughs> as a subspecies. Um, thank you, guys. And Bruce, if that didn't answer your follow-up question, let me know in the chat and we can um, get back to it. I know Harris has um, their hand raised. So Harris, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Am I audible? Yep. You are? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, maybe you just answered this, but how are you maintaining um, genetic diversity within the subspecies? And as a follow-on question, what is the, what's the world look like to get to a place where, you know, these populations are self-sustaining, you know, not requiring the micromanagement you guys have been highlighting here. Is it, is it even feasible <laughs> to get to a place where they're, they're um, in the wild and countable, I suppose you could say, as, as a lister, for instance? Thanks. Thanks for the question. I, I'll take the first part of that, at least, uh, <laughs> from... Uh, uh, we do uh, implement a software uh, called PMX, and uh, that software kind of looks at the genetic and demographic uh, characteristics of the population to make uh, you know breeding recommendations to determine the relatedness of individuals to each other. Um, so we use that uh, at the conservation breeding centers. We use that to make our pairings every year. Um, and we also, so that we producing genetically valuable, demographically valuable offspring for release to help the populations in the wild. Uh, but we also use that software to figure out what birds in the wild have the most important genetics that we don't have at the conservation breeding centers. So we target uh, a specific number uh, of birds every year, depending on, you know, their uniqueness. So for example, you know, we'll send a list to, uh, FWC, uh, these birds are, are ones we don't have at the conservation breeding centers genetically, and we, we need to acquire them. And so we, together with FWC and us, we've worked out uh, techniques to swap eggs and nestlings uh, from, from a, a nest at White Oak. We'll capture the nestlings 
uh, and we'll, or the eggs and we'll, we'll drive down or meet halfway or what have you with uh, FWC and they'll have their nestlings from their important nest and we'll, we'll swap them basically. So we're not negatively impacting either population, but yet we're uh, helping the whole population genetically. Yeah, and the, the second part to that question is about management, and that's a, a really good question. We definitely don't foresee, or the, the aim of this project, or the whole program, is to not have to micromanage the population. So right now, as uh, a lot of our actions are kind of emergency actions because the population was doing very poorly. So this nest protection is a good example of it, right? We're, we're doing a lot of, we need a lot of, um, boots on the ground, finding the nest, protecting them, and that takes a lot of effort. Uh, but we're moving towards doing like large uh, land management uh, activities that will help the, the population as a whole. So the, the, the main goal is to do that, is to, to find, have a better understanding of what are the management activities that uh, could help the population on a larger scale. For example, I talked a little bit about mechanical removal of woody vegetation. We, we've seen a, a positive impact of that in certain areas. So if that helps the population, it potentially could, could also have cascading effects on the nest predator community and all that. So we're looking at, at those types of questions to hopefully move back uh, gradually over time uh, so that we don't have to micromanage them. Great, well said. Sarah, I don't know if you wanted to um say anything else about that question, the Harris's question? No, nope, I second with, um, with Juan. Juan is saying is that we're you know, hoping to get um, some more research to figure out why their sparrows are declining and also try and eventually scale back our, our so intensive hands-on nest protection efforts um, because um, those are definitely a lot of, a lot of work, um, but have been, definitely helpful for um, conserving sparrows currently. So. Well, said. Um, well, I wanna just, we have a few minutes left. I wanna be respectful of everybody's time since it's super busy this time of year. And I know I got you guys on a lunch break. Um, so I wanted to just thank, thank again, our partners, um, Sarah, Juan, Andrew on this call with FWC and White Oak, addition to our partners at um, US Fish and Wildlife Service when it obviously be able to do any of that without them. Um, thank you to, to the funders, um, the folks of you who donate individually by our conserved wildlife plate. If you have any questions about any of that um, work or where to get a plate or how to make a donation, feel free to send me a message. Um, my contact information is on our website, wildlifeflorida.org. Um, I'm also going to um, drop a survey link in the chat. Um, we'd love to get your feedback on what other topics you'd want us to cover, how we could improve this. Um, and we are recording today. And so um, once we get the recording cleaned up, we'll share it back the same way you got the Zoom link in case you have um, friends you wanna share it with, or you're just really excited about watching those amazing grasshopper sparrow videos again. Um, I wanted to give uh, Sarah Juan and Andrew um, a few minutes in case they had any um, comments come up during our conversation. They wanted to make sure um, we didn't get a chance to say. Juan, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I saw a quick question about what kinds of snakes are, mm -hmm. are predators. Corn snakes is the big one. Corn snakes are notorious uh, just for in predating bird nests. Uh, then we have uh, rat snakes and uh, yeah, well, anything else, Sarah, for snakes? Yes, um, I can tell you a bit about snakes currently. I'm <laughs> looking into some of their predation on our nests. Um, uh, well, mammals have been the, the main predators of the nests. Um, the main snakes that have been predating them is one saying are corn snakes, yellow rat snakes, um, occasionally black racers. Um, and they, corn snakes and yellow rat snakes will also predate not just the nestlings, but adults sometimes as well. Well, um, I wanted to say thank you once again to everyone for your support and thank you for attending today. It's great to, to share some of our work with you.
You know, thank you everyone on the call. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, FWFF, for all you guys do for photographs. Our pleasure. And if you and if there are questions that folks um, have come up again, feel free to also send those to me. I can send them along to Juan, um, Andrew, and Sarah, and we can get your questions um, your questions answered in case you know you have something pop up here in the next five minutes you wish you had asked or we didn't get a chance to cover it um, as in depth as you would have liked. But um, I just wanted to thank everyone again and look forward to to being in touch soon. Thanks, guys.